Yeah, I'd just like to um, uh, <coughs> apologise for the fact that my voice is a little bit hoarse today and I may be um, <coughs> to stop for the odd cough and sneeze during the course of my talk. I hope it won't disturb you too much. I'd just like to begin by making a general comment about religion in general. <laughs> and uh, when people talk about religion, they usually start at the top and work down. Um, so um, people talk about their understanding of God or the um, ultimate reality um, and so on as being um, defining um, factors of their religious affiliation. Um, in, in Buddhism, uh, we start from the bottom and work upwards. Um, so uh, we start off with the um, basic human condition and, and look at how our lives are and the manner. And with regard to this, um, I think it's very important that we make a clear distinction between belief and knowledge. Um, I think um, much of the difficulties in the world between religions these days is that these two words are not uh, distinguished clearly enough. And uh, people who have strong faith in religious teachings often take that to be a form of knowledge. And so they say, I, I believe. Um, uh, how do you know? Um, that uh, what you believe is true um, because uh, I, the belief is so so strong and so real uh, to me and, and it leads to a kind of circular reasoning um, I believe um, because I know I know because I believe um, in, uh, in, in Buddhism um, we take knowledge as meaning a direct experience um, of of reality or of, of um, whatever level. So, as regards various religious teachings on um, the ultimate nature of, of reality and, and God and all these things, um, the first and most important thing to remember, I think, for 99.99%, can, can you all hear me by the way? is that we don't know. <laughs> so I say, um, do you believe in, in reincarnation or rebirth? And uh, probably many of you will say yes. Um, but the important thing to um, not, forget, not forget is that you don't know. Um, so Christians may believe that um, Jesus died for their sin to uh, save them from their sins but they don't know and uh, Muslims I believe that uh, Muhammad was the uh, last and greatest of the prophets and so on but they don't know so I think a very humble way um, to start with religious dialogue is not from the top and to say all religions teach the same thing and they're all going to the same place and because um that, quite frankly, is a point of view that comes from ignorance. People don't actually know that. But if we um, say that we have different beliefs, and we have beliefs because of this reason and that reason, and we're happy with our beliefs, but um, we don't know whether our beliefs are true. Um, and you see, um, Uncertainty uh, for for most of us is quite threatening, and many people look to religion uh, for a sense of certainty uh, and stability. Um, but Buddhism uh, is teaching them the wisdom of insecurity and facing up um, to instability and looking very closely um, at the nature of our minds, particularly that part of our minds that wants everything set out very clearly, the answers for everything, 
that we can hold on to. So, um, in, in, in Buddhism, at least in the uh, tradition in which I studied and practiced, um, we, we leave aside all those, those things. It's rather like, um, let's say, bread or, or roti. Let's say bread. Um, <coughs> The, if you're trying to um, explain to someone who's never eaten bread before exactly what it tastes like, tastes like you won't be very successful. It's far more practical to tell somebody what the ingredients are, how the ingredients should be mixed together, how they should be cooked for what length of time, what temperature, and so on, um, and let the person eat uh, for themselves. So the level on, uh, on the subject of, of happiness, um, I, would, I would propose that um, we don't really know what it is yet. Um, we might have some experience of some kinds of, of happiness. But my first um, uh, proposal here is that Happiness is of um, a number of different levels. There's a hierarchy of happiness. And certain forms of the lower levels of happiness are compatible with the higher forms of happiness. Other forms of the basic um, level of pleasure and happiness are incompatible. So the wise person is one who is looking into this whole question of happiness, what it is, um, if there are different kinds of happiness, um, and what are the obstacles to happiness, and what are the uh, means by which we can surmount those obstacles. So it's a very practical uh, kind of teaching. The saying that um, religion um, is not, or should not be so much about what you believe, um, but it's about what you do, uh, what you, how you speak, how you relate to the people around you, and how you use your mind. Um, this we've seen so many people um, so often uh, in so many countries of the world who have very inspiring beliefs. Um, but their actions, particularly in times of stress and difficulty, are not consistent with their beliefs. Um, so this is, uh, I think, more of a, um, a more important religious problem rather than um, protecting um, belief systems. It's understanding the nature of belief uh, and having adopted certain ideals um, training and educating oneself in order to be able to act in ways which agree with, which are consistent with those beliefs. Now, um, there's some, uh, some teachings, some religious traditions um, uh, are very um, critical uh, and um, speak very harshly of sensual desires, the kinds of pleasure that we receive um, through seeing beautiful, attractive things, hearing beautiful sounds, enjoying pleasant odors and tastes and physical sensations and so on. Um, the, the problem is if we just take a, a very negative attitude uh, towards sensual pleasures rather than using um, our wisdom faculty, um, they often uh, people can get very repressed or they hold, uh, they try to force themselves um, to refrain from certain behaviors, um, so it leads them to um, displace that energy into um, other areas, perhaps equally harmful. Um, or else um, are able to maintain a certain standard for a certain length of time um, and then um, completely 
let themselves go for a while and then full of um, anger and guilt um, and self-aversion um, try to make a fresh start and this kind of cycle um, of restraint um, and uh, indulgence <coughs> is one that, that many people are familiar with um, if we look at it from a different angle um, and instead of saying this is a wonderful thing this is beautiful this is really you know really it um, but it's wrong it's bad I shouldn't um, but um, we take another attitude and say is it really so wonderful as I think if it is it should stand up to some close analysis really look at the thing the object of desire and see whether it really fulfills us in the way um, that we would like it to do so um, and I think through looking um, at the essential pleasures in this way um, then the interest in them um, weakens to some extent of course it doesn't mean that um, you become a complete um, kind of, uh, unfeeling vegetable but it does mean that um, rather than seeking sensual pleasures as a refuge in life they become um, an, add, um, an additive or something which um, just adds a bit of spice to one's life um, but without leading one into actions and behavior that one may regret um, and feel bad about afterwards So some um, certain observations can be made. Um, the very nature of our body and our mind means that we can't um, experience unremitting, constant pleasure for any great length of time. Our physical body um, gets tired, um, we need food, um, we need rest, um, and the and our body sometimes gets, um, gets sick and gets ill. Um, so if our, um, our happiness is exclusively or mainly bound up with things outside of ourselves, um, then we have a certain problem. Um, the problem is um, that our ability to control and uh, to manipulate uh, things outside of ourselves is very limited. And indeed, the um, the effort the, the, um, to control and manipulate things outside ourselves to provide us with the kind of pleasure and happiness that we desire um, is um, very often a short part of the neurosis. So um, we look um, at the drawbacks, the flaws in sensual pleasures, rather than adopting a certain attitude, they're wonderful or they're terrible or they're evil or they're good so let's, look, let's just look at the experience um, this is not a matter of religious belief, it's just looking every one of us whether we have a religious belief or not we can look at our own experience um, so what's it all about how does it feel um, if we um, desire something it might be a, um, a new car or a new sari or anything, some, something that we really want. Um, how does that wanting change our general experience? We can make certain um, observations, I think, quite clearly. In the case in which we are pursuing um, an object which is of interest to other people, then our sense of um, uh, love and companionship sense of identification with others as companions um, in birth, old age, sickness and death um, is much reduced and we begin to look on others as competitors so um, this change in attitude to um, other people who are pursuing the same kinds of pleasure um, 
is something that really needs to be looked into. The way our feelings towards people um, change, um, the sense of uh, tension and fear that we're not going to get the thing that we that we want, and um, the um, various um, kinds of mental sufferings that arise in the pursuit of sensual pleasure um, should be included within our whole understanding um, of the role of sensual pleasures in our life. Um, when we finally attain the object of desire, there is a, um, often a sense of joy, um, exaltation even, but again, it's interesting to look at to what extent that um, particular joy that we feel is the release of the tension we've experienced in the pursuit of that object. We gain the object, and then what happens? It's impossible to maintain that high, isn't it? Um, even if we were, let's say, you were an art lover, and you were able to purchase the Mona Lisa or the most um, beautiful painting in the world and put it on the wall right there. How long do you think you could sit and gaze at that painting and still enjoy it uh, before you started to get a bit restless, a bit bored? Um, and, and this is just part and parcel of experience, isn't it? We, you, you can't maintain the mind on that same high level for any length of time. The mind just, just can't do that. Um, the nervous system can't, um, can't produce adrenaline um, and all those chemicals that, that um, contribute to that high feeling for any length of time. This is human biology, this is the nature of the body and the mind. So even if we don't gain something that we've desired and we're, we're happy with it, so after a while we get uh, used to it. Um, another um, often overlooked but central fact of human experience, we get used to things. Um, and uh, perhaps after a while we get bored with something which um, formerly gave us a great deal of pleasure. So if we look at the, the whole process from that moment of desire, search for the object, experience of the object, sense of familiarity, perhaps even contempt, uh, um, also um, other feelings, fear of separation. You see like in the very affluent cultures or affluent um, groups within a society um, that, that they're experiencing the, the pleasures of possession, uh, but often a great deal of fear and paranoia. You see this in America, the fear of being separated uh, from the standard of living uh, which they have um, been able to um, create in that country. So um, then there's fear of separation and then inevitably there's a separation. So um, in, in, um, in Thailand, in, uh, in monasteries, we teach all the, um, the local people who come um, to the monastery in the mornings or um, on the um, on equivalent of the Sabbath day um, to chant um, every day in their homes a certain chant which is to say I am of the nature to age I have not gone beyond aging I am of the nature to die I have not uh, sick and I have not gone beyond sickness I am of the nature to die I have not gone beyond dying I will become separated from all that I love and all that I love um, so the idea being that rather than turning your back on the, the shadow side of existence um, and those things that um, um, make you feel a little bit afraid um, that um, we face up to them and we remind ourselves every single day that sooner or later we're going to be separated um, from every single person that we love. Um, and this is surely inarguable um, that um, if you don't um, die before um, the people that you love, they will die before you do. And thinking like that is not to um, make us morbid, of course, um, but to see the value of 
each other. Um, if you constantly remind yourself of the inevitability of death and separation um, and the uncertainty of when it will occur, um, then I think you'll be less likely to get into foolish arguments about petty matters um, and, and sulking and, and um, hanging out until you have a sense of being the victor in some kind of argument. And so that life's too short. We don't know um, how long we'll be together. When I was um, a teenager, I had um, red on quite long hair and it was a real problem at home and a lot of arguments with my parents. And uh, I had a great um, urge to come to India and at the age of 17 I left home and worked for a while and then hitchhiked all the way from England to India. And uh, in 1975, I, I'm just um, driving across Chalpati Beach yesterday, 1975, um, I remember walking along that beach as a young teenager. Um, subsequently, I went to Thailand and became a, a Buddhist monk. And um, it, I was in Thailand for some six years before I returned to visit my family for the first time in England. And uh, of course, by and this time, you know, my hair was like this, no hair at all. And um, so I remember sitting in the car, um, driving home from the monastery in the south of England, where I was staying, that uh, my mother said to me, you know, if I had known that you were only going to be at home until you were 17 years old, I would never have made such a fuss about the length of your hair. Um, and... Um, Funnily enough, at that very same moment, um, I'd been thinking to myself, you know, if I had known that I was only going to be with my parents until I was 17 years old, I wouldn't have made such a fuss about having long hair. You know? But it, it's always so easy after the fact, isn't it? And, you know, we're all, we can all be wise um, before the, um, events and after, particularly after events. Um, but it's being able to, to um, draw on that wisdom um, at the time when there are difficulties, which is uh, there is skill in life. <coughs> so the um, question of, of sensual pleasures, I'm, I'm putting this at the bottom of my hierarchy of happiness um, because it's so uncertain, uncontrollable, changing all the time. Um, and it doesn't uh, ever really fulfill you. The um, sensual pleasures, I think, very clearly um, are subject to what we call the law of diminishing returns. Um, we see this, say, perhaps with the most coarse kind of sensual pleasure that derived from, um, from drugs. You take a drug for a certain while, receive a certain uh, kind of pleasure from it, but after a while, you don't get the same hit from the drugs because you have to increase the dose and you get into this um, cycle of having to constantly increase the dose just to maintain the same level of intoxication um, and all forms of, of sensual pleasure I would suggest are of a very similar nature. Now, um, we're certainly not advocating um, all of you to become monks and nuns and to give up all sensual pleasures. But um, what I am advocating is that you turn the light of attention towards that and to the role of sensual pleasures in your life uh, and to how much importance you give them. And in your um, search for happiness in life, um, what, and what role they play and how central a role they play in that. Now, um, in, in Buddhism, uh, we say that um, a slightly higher form uh, of pleasure and happiness, um, which I'm sure all of you uh, will know very well, that's the happiness of giving. And um, 
when we give, um, whether it's material things, whether it's um, time, attention to someone who's feeling, uh, when we give forgiveness to someone who's um, uh, hurt our feelings, um, or when we share knowledge and understanding with others, that's definitely a form of happiness, isn't it? And um, I think that although we call it happiness, just as we say, we, oh, we had a wonderful holiday, I was very happy, um, there is, um, I would think, something um, that deserves um, it being put on a higher level. It's a, it's a purer form uh, of happiness. And of course, the um, happiness of giving um, is, is also bound up with the, the happiness of, of taking. This is something I had to learn as a Buddhist monk. Um, as a Buddhist monk, I'm, I'm not allowed to touch money. Um, I have no possessions. And um, in, uh, in the monastery in, in Thailand, where I, in the jungle where I live for many years, um, no one has um, private possessions, any um, donations are offered to the monastery, are put into a central fund, and then you have any needs, you, you ask the abbot um, for them. You can't go anywhere unless somebody um, is willing to um, offer you a ticket. I came here to India because someone offered me a ticket, but because I, I could buy a ticket for myself. Um, but then you realize that one way of, of giving is also giving people the opportunity to, to give to you. And I think for, obviously very um, selfish people don't have a problem about um, being uh, people um, doing things for them. But as you start to um, uh, develop more spiritually, you get great, get great joy in giving. And it can be very hard to receive. Um, but the um, the wise person is one uh, who can give um, when it is time to give and can receive when it's time to receive. Um, and uh, sometimes um, not willing to be willing to uh, receive, afraid of being a burden on other people, um, is, is a form of conceit rather than a form of goodness. So giving and sharing um, I think is a, a wonderful um, part of life. It makes people very happy. So even uh, very, very poor people um, often experience uh, this form um, of, of giving. Um, uh, before, before I came to Bombay, I, I've been walking um, through the countryside um, from Morangabad and around Ajanta and Elora um, in the traditional way of the Buddhist monk, just walking by myself and um, going into villages for uh, alms food in the morning. And uh, just so wonderful to see the response of um, Buddhist people, particularly out in the countryside, people who are so poor, um, most uh, no possessions at all, but you can see they're just beaming and just absolutely overjoyed to have the chance to um, offer a few chapatis and, and some dal to um, a visiting monk. So this is um, a happiness that we can all cultivate very easily, I think. <coughs> of course, it's easy to, to give and to share to family members or people that we love, but for it to be a real spiritual practice, we have to expand that more and more. Um, so that it's not um, in any way um, sort of partisan or um, a group um, kind of thing. Now the, 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 joy of, the joy of giving, I think, is um, probably not at all controversial. The, the next um, kind of, of um, happiness, pleasure I'd like to talk about, is probably not so obvious, and that's the pleasure of um, leading a moral life. Now, in, in, in the theistic religions, the real problem with morality in the last hundred years or so, um, in one, uh, one respect that 
when morality is considered to be conferred um, or uh, given by God, when we find people who um, don't believe in the dogmas or don't believe in God anymore, then they don't see any reason why they should believe in morality. Uh, if it's uh, the person who, who gives it, um, doesn't exist. So this has been a big problem in, um, in the Western world, obviously. Um, in, in Buddhism, um, morality is uh, not considered to um, be a matter of commandments, and there's no um, reward and punishment um, idea. But again, we start off with the uh, basic facts of human existence, starting off with the fact that um, no human being to think desires to suffer even a little bit. Um, and everyone desires to be happy. If you could increase um, the happiness in your life by even a little bit, I'm sure you'd be interested. <coughs> so, one of the best from that um, basic principle of morality is uh, not harming. And that um, takes precedence um, above you know, religious teachings and, and dogmas and power. Um, there are no exceptions um, to that rule. Now, um, an exercise I've done with children in Thailand is to say, okay, if you, um, if you had a magic wand, and you say, well, what kind of community, what kind of society would you um, like to live in? How would you like people to relate to each other? And um, almost everybody would say, well, I'd like to um, live in a way that people are friendly towards each other, people don't hurt each other, people don't abuse each other. Um, you want to live in a community where you don't have to worry um, that your things are going to be stolen. Um, if you are uh, married, uh, you don't want to have to worry about your husband, your wife running off with someone else or someone else trying to uh, run off with your husband or your wife. You want to be able to live um, in a community where um, you can trust that when people um, tell you something, it's the truth. Um, and you want to live in a, in a society where people can um, are capable of taking responsibility for their actions. So from this we get a um, basic principle. Okay, well, what about if we make a decision as a group that even if we feel very angry, aggressive, we won't hurt each other. Even if we desire things that belong to somebody else, we won't take them. <coughs> even if we find someone else's partner attractive, um, we uh, won't um, act or speak in any unbecoming way to, towards them, try to uh, create any um, inappropriate relationship to someone who's already married or has a partner, that we will um, tell the truth, that we won't take drink and drugs which are undermine our um, sense of responsibility um, and clarity of mind. This is the basis of morality. It's the foundation for um, communities that um, are worth living in, that um, give us a sense of security um, and happiness. Now, um, many religions in the world are, uh, can be defined as belief systems. Um, we often refer to them as the great faiths. Um, Buddhism is a different kind of religion. It's a belief. It's a excuse me. It's not a belief system. It's an education system. So, when people um, go to Buddhist monasteries, um, they often ask to take what they call the five precepts from the monks in, in a formal ceremony. And the um, the form of the ceremony is that people say. Um, for instance, Parna Dipata Viramani Sikha Padang Samadhyami. Now, Parna 
but that means not to kill. And it means to kill. There are many means to refrain. But the two last words very interesting. Sikapadan uh, means a training rule, and, um, and Sabadian means undertake. So it doesn't mean to say, I vow not to kill. But it says, I, I take uh, on the um, restraint or refraining from harming others as a training rule, as a way of educating my conduct. So, so this is a different way of looking at ethics, morality. Not looking at it as a group of commandments that one, that one keeps um, out of obedience and love of God, but taking on um, training rules, ways of um, uh, educating our conduct. Now, in the, um, in the practice of search for, for happiness, we have to educate ourselves. <coughs> educate um, our ability to appreciate the high forms of happiness, our ability to experience them. And um, in, the, uh, in this process, uh, what is probably most essential is that sense of self-respect or or in the modern Western Indian self-esteem. So, um, the Buddha is saying that um, giving, sharing, um, and um, a moral life are the foundations of self-esteem. So, with the uh, morality, it means it must come from you. You must see the, the value of every single one of these training rules. And the idea is of establishing certain boundaries for yourself voluntarily, seeing the value of them, seeing the suffering inherent in not having those boundaries, and then training yourself, educating yourself to be able to live within those boundaries. And the more um, to which you are able to consistently um, conduct yourself within those boundaries, then the more the sense of self-respect, self conduct uh, um, self-esteem will arise and of course happiness the basic kind of happiness will surely follow now in that um, training we are making use of a basic human ability it's a wonderful ability and one that um, again is, is often uh, overlooked or undervalued and that's the, the intention not to do um, now, if you compare human beings with animals, you know, so obviously you couldn't ever um, teach a cat uh, to feel sorry for a mouse and not to chase after a mouse, because a cat is a, is a creature of its instincts. We, as human beings, also have instincts, natural instincts, but we can... Um, in certain, uh, certain circumstances say no, in that particular area I'm not going to follow my instincts and this is something which is um, practical, reasonable uh, not beyond anybody um, to, uh, to do I'm sure all of you do it every day um, so this ability uh, not to do certain things is something which gives shape and meaning to life and uh, for those of you who paint or write or something, you, I'm sure you have um, noticed that often what you don't put into the uh, article or into the painting or what you leave and is often as important as what you put in. So, um, to give an example of how keeping precepts is a form of education or training, let's take the um, simple case of a mosquito. Um, biting your wrist. Now, the purely instinctive, automatic, unthinking reaction to pain is go away as quickly as possible. So you kill the mosquito. But in the case that, that you've taken on this precept very sincerely and you're, you're going to train your conduct using it, say the mosquito bites you, and then at that moment you realize what you're doing and you stop 
Now that's a very interesting um, uh, thing to happen. You stop. You don't follow the instinct. And the moment you stop, there's a small moment of awakening. And that small moment of awakening um, is uh, one in which it is, as it were, you drive a wedge in between an intention and its expression. Usually intention uh, results in expression almost immediately. So you need a tool to be able um, to pull these two apart, intention and expression. And the recollection, or in Buddhist terminology, mindfulness of a precept, which you've taken on voluntarily, um, is the technique, um, is the mechanism, if you like, which um, stops you and allows you to make a choice. Do I really want to do this? Do I want to kill this mosquito or not? Is it consistent with my ideals and my beliefs or not? You see? So we're going to be on um, beliefs and we're getting to like, the nitty gritty of how you actually deal with your mind in daily life. Um, what tools can you make use of? And so recollection, mindfulness um, of a precept in, in matters of conduct and speech um, is, is the basic tool. So you stop and say, what do I really want to know? I don't know how to kill that, just brush it away. Now, um, although um, in most spiritual matters, um, you notice that in inner education, transformation, evolution, will naturally affect your, your conduct. Um, thoughts of loving kindness and compassion will, will naturally express in how you relate to others, how you speak. Uh, to others. But there is a parallel uh, complementary practice from the outside inwards, which means that if you uh, um, maintain that um, training of conduct, let's say in this um, occasion with um, creatures like mosquitoes and ants and um, scorpions and things that you don't like or frighten you, but um, every time that intention to kill that creature is not acted upon, then the power of that intention um, weakens, and the power of the uh, non-harming intention is strengthened. And so, if you consistently, continually refrain from killing the mosquito, you'll notice over a period of time that the intention to kill the mosquito um, uh, disappears or virtually never arises. And with the absence of that intention to harm, feelings of loving kindness start to arise naturally. So compassion, loving kindness arising through uh, consistently following um, this practice of refraining from certain kinds of uh, conduct. So sila um, of the precepts is, is creating um, harmony um, in families, in communities and societies, but on the internal level it's creating a sense of um, self-respect, self-esteem and, and um, reducing greatly the sense of guilt and thoughts just going over and over and over about things that you've said and done in the past. Now, for the higher levels of spiritual development and the happiness which is uh, concomitant with them, um, you have to have, you have to be a good friend to yourself. You have to really want yourself, uh, desire for yourself to um, experience the higher forms of happiness. If you think that you're a bad person, you don't really deserve to be happy, then you're never going to really pursue um, those practices which will produce that kind of happiness. Um, so this is the uh, foundation that um, we need to develop. Okay, the intention to refrain from certain kinds of action uh, will um, certainly increase the amount of happiness in your life um, and um, will have a very positive effect on relationships with people around you. Uh, there is, uh, by the way, um, a certain uh, another point that the Buddha 
put it down. That if you are, let's say, pure in your conduct, in the in the sense of refraining from killing and stealing, sexual misconduct, lying, drinking drugs, and so on, but because of that, you uh, start to feel that you're somehow superior to someone who doesn't. Then the Buddha says your morality is soiled; it's impure. Um, so, you, so purity is not just a matter of um, keeping all the rules or the training rules, but it's also your attitude towards yourself and others at the same time. So, it's, it's quite a subtle thing. Okay, um, there still remains a problem. You can still suffer a lot, even if you're kind and generous and you lead a moral life. Um, because um, the um, most important determin- determinant of your happiness in life is your mind, of course. And so we have to find a way of dealing uh, with our mind and our emotions and finding ways of reducing the power of negative emotions and promoting the power of positive emotions. Again, this is not. Uh, this, you know, people say, "Oh, I'm this kind of person and that kind of person. I'm very confused. I get very jealous. I've got a bad temper." You know, as if these things are sort of given and that um, you're always going to be that way. But these things are just habits um, and things that you've you've cultivated. Um, so if you cultivate your mind in a different way, um, there's no reason. Um, why you cannot make um, um, quite radical changes um, in your life. And this is, uh, in fact, um, a, um, a principle which is being more and more accepted in the scientific community, particularly through the advances in um, technology producing um, MRI machines and so on, that the, the old scientific dogma um, that the brain is a fixed thing and the mind is an epiphenomenon of the brain. It's not a real thing. Um, it's just a sort of a product of the chemicals and neurons and things sort of in, your, in your brain. Um, that that um, belief has sort of gone out the window now because they've discovered something they call neuroplasticity. Um, it shows that um, your brain is changing all the time. If you meditate a lot, your brain starts working in a different way. Or even if you learn to play a musical instrument, your brain changes. So it's not that the brain is producing the mind, which is uh, the other way around. But when process, um, they affect each other. So, um, you know, definitely you can make changes, but there, um, it has to be done in a systematic way. It's not something that you can do called neuroplasticity. Um, it shows that um, your brain is changing all the time. If you meditate a lot, your brain starts working in a different way. Or even if you learn to play a musical instrument, your brain changes. Practical um, to make a, a decision. Okay, no matter how angry I am, I'm not going to express that physically or verbally. I'm not going to hit somebody. I'm going to swear at them. But you can't make a um, decision um, I'm not going to get angry with them. I'm just going to be forgiving and kind and loving all day. Um, that, that's beyond the sphere of intention. Um, here we have to um, to the sphere of mental development. Um, and um, again, the um, primary um, engine of, of this development is we call mindfulness. Um, and this is the ability to Um, to make the mind um, clear, bright and present Um, learning to excuse me um, uh, to abandon, to let go of all the unnecessary thinking in your mind so um, if you were to um, look at um, what you think about every day moment you get up to the time you go to bed I think that you would have to um, agree um, somewhat sadly that probably 90% of your thoughts are, um, are basically junk 
and that don't add anything to quality of your life at all. Um, sometimes it's just thinking, just for the sake of thinking, just to um, have something or, or other going on. But other time, um, as a reaction to a sense of uh, boredom or um, unhappiness of some kind, then trying to remember some pleasant experience in the past or some pleasant experience anticipated in the future um, as a way of making yourself feel better, so uh, self-medication. But um, there is an alternative uh, to this, and this is the, um, the ability to be present, and when the mind is very sharp, there is a recognition of these um, unwholesome or negative thought patterns arising in the mind. And usually that mere moment of awareness is sufficient for um, that thought pattern um, to pass away. And um, bringing the mind back to the present moment again and again and again, then the um, our attitude and relationship to thought and mental activity starts to change uh, because you see it's not quite so compelling um, as it used to be. You don't believe in your thinking so much. You see, it's quite insubstantial. The moment you turn the light of awareness on it, it tends just to pass away. So the ability to do that in your daily life is going to be uh, dependent uh, to a certain extent on um, adopting certain meditative meditat- ex- um, exercises where you seem to develop this power of mindfulness like a muscle, just like you um, do particular exercises to um, develop your physical body and the health of the body. You need to develop these mental muscles, the mental muscle of mindfulness. So you can take on um, any, uh, any number of different um, meditation objects. Uh, one commonly used in the Buddhist world is the sensation of the breath. Um, it's a rise uh, that um, manifests at the end of the nose. It's just an anchor for mindfulness. The mind wanders off, bring it back. Wanders off, bring it back. Very, very patiently, gently, but firmly. <coughs> And uh, when you try to do that, the um, first experience is quite sobering because you realize what an absolute mess your mind is and how completely out of control it is. Um, but if you don't um, become discouraged and you stick at it, after a while, the mind starts to calm down um, and there start to be gaps between um, the mental activity and then you start to experience a sense of calm and peace. And this is the next level of happiness. This is the happiness of inner peace. Um, it's difficult, certainly it's very difficult, it's an incredible challenge. And there are all kinds of <coughs> obstacles um, and um, challenges which will, which will arise. For instance, most people experience um, incredible mental agitation when they first start to calm their minds. After a while, the mental agitation starts to uh, diminish, and then often people get very sleepy, and often people will go between these two poles of agitation and sleepiness for quite some time. Um, but this is something that's going on anyway. If you're ever on a, uh, if you've been on a plane or anywhere on a long journey, you notice that people you know, have to have something to do. To read a newspaper, read a book, watch a movie, eat something. As soon as there's nothing to do, what do people do? Fall asleep. You know, this, uh, so, m- mostly we know movement, thought, agitation, and sleep, or dullness. Um, so, the, the effort here is to develop um, that ability to dwell in the middle space where not thinking necessarily, but not dull or not sleepy. Um, then sometimes there can be strong feelings of anger and aggression, strong feelings of lust and desire, all kinds of doubts and, and worries arising in the mind. And so these, these are the, the um, we call the maras, or the, the, um, the, the obstacles in, in this form of spiritual development. 
but these are things that must be overcome. And uh, when the mind lets go of these different hindrances and negative emotions, then the peace that arises brings with it uh, a great uh, deal of bliss and a form of, of happiness that is so um, obviously and uh, incontrovertibly superior to anything that one's ever experienced that um, one has a new relationship with the other forms of happiness. And uh, I think um, on a social level, um, dealing with social problems and young people, um, drugs and all, all these things, that um, if people are pursuing very um, harmful ways of um, experiencing pleasure, you can't just take those away from them without being able to provide them with some alternative. And teaching children from a young age um, to be able to deal with their emotions and to be able to let go of negative um, thoughts and thought patterns and to develop that inner peace and clarity I think is, a, um, is the best way to, uh, to be able to like, vaccinate children from the kinds of pressures and temptations that come through in adolescence. <coughs> okay, so I'm um, from, from peace, but there's something beyond peace, because peace is still um, a condition. It's still um, something that arises and passes away, and if someone's uh, been meditating a lot, then they get very ill, very sick, or some, uh, all kinds of things can happen, and that peace can still um, disappear. And uh, it's not yet a true refuge. So when the mind is peaceful, then we use that peaceful mind to look very closely um, at the nature of body and mind in order to uproot um, the attachment to the physical body, to feelings, to perceptions, to thoughts, to emotions, to sense consciousness as being me and being mine. Because that's the, the, the um, underlying <coughs> Uh, root cause of suffering or lack of true happiness. This attachment uh, to things that are not substantial, not really who we are as being me, as being mine. And me and mine, then you all authentically have separation of what's not me, what's not mine. And uh, various uh, kinds of suffering arising. So when the mind is um, calm, clear, and bright, and sharp, um, and blissful, um, but still has a certain amount of, um, of um, mental um, activity, and then using that mind to focus on present experience um, in order to see how every single part of our body and mind is rising and passing away as a natural phenomenon. Uh, it's, a, it's a river, it's a flow. There's not one, you can't point to any single one thing and say, that's who I am. And this is where it's a real kind of liberating um, experience. And, and through that liberating experience, one experiences a highest form of happiness, a form of uh, wisdom, liberation. And it's very difficult to talk about this. Um, it's similar to, um, let's say, perfect health. I mean, how can you define health? Uh, other than to say what's well, not there. You don't have this illness, you don't have that illness. But to speak about health in a positive idiom is very difficult or impossible. And, and similarly, the, the highest form of happiness is the happiness of a complete absence of suffering and its cause and something which is uh, within the, uh, the reach of, of every one of us, man, woman, and child. Um, it's a matter of following this education process, one which we're um, using in our uh, external affairs, conduct, relationship between the world around us, using this, um, uh, essentially this, this power of refraining and training ourselves with mindfulness, training the, um, um, the mind, the emotions, using mindfulness, looking within, finding skillful means to promote um, qualities such as uh, contentment, loving kindness, uh, compassion, patience, and so on. And finding 
skillful means to uh, prevent the negative emotions from arising and then finding skillful means and techniques um, to overcome, to let go of, to abandon the negative emotions that have arisen. And then using the mind which is fortified and strengthened with peace um, to look more and more closely at the nature of our body and minds to uh, develop this liberation from uh, wrong understanding uh, um, assumptions that we've that we've made through influences from our culture, from people around us, just through <coughs> all through conditioning of many, many lifetimes, and developing a clear, penetrative understanding of the way things are. So I've I've spoken um, at length, very longer than I intended to. I hope it hasn't been too long for you. Uh, thanks.